Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to your Friday edition of the Trader Merlin Show. Good trading week out there. Lots of volatility, lots of excitement. We had tons of headlines, which made this week even more exciting. So cheers. I uh, hope you all have something fun planned for the weekend. I've got all kinds of good stuff. Of course, watching my 49ers go 4-0 will be the highlight of the weekend. All right. 46 eyes, yes, but only four likes. I know, Sly Dog. It's a slow start to our Friday session. That's okay. We'll have some fun. I'm going to dive right into it. We'll see. Maybe I can actually get this out under 30 minutes. So uh, best, uh, all the best, John, to your wife. Hope she's okay in the ER. Not the best way to start a weekend, but you'll get to be the pampering husband this weekend. Uh, let's go into my graphic here today. Trading week wrap up. You can see I've got a picture of the government looking um, dark and stormy and gloomy. I'm going to start there. I know I've got a lot of different things I want to talk about, but let's... Um, Let's go right into a viewer question, and of course, we—I talked about this in the oops. I talked about this in the other day, which was, what are my thoughts on um, the market with the government shutdown, right? And this was a question that came in from Les yesterday or the day before, and here, here's the graphic for it. Do you have any thoughts about government shutdown and how it might affect the markets and our trades? And it's a great question because when you have something as as, as significant as a government shutdown. Instantly, we think negative, we think bad, we think it's not going to function. However, I, I told you if I had some time, I would do a little bit of digging. Well, I didn't really have the time, but I did some digging anyway. And I looked at the last three times that we had a significant government shutdown and, and what happened with those market reactions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll way back. I'm going to start with one, uh, one of the earlier ones, which was Bill Clinton. You guys might remember, under Bill Clinton, we had a couple different shutdowns. There were two of them. Let me um, see if I can find it here. I hope I have them all mapped out. And maybe this has disappeared on me. I did them on a daily time frame, so I have to scroll way back through time to find these things. So here we go. Let me zoom out, find them. Um, it was, there's one in 2019, 1819. That's the Trump one. There's the Obama one. And let's go all the way back into 96, I believe. It was actually... Uh, 95 to 96, there was a 21-day government shutdown under Bill Clinton. It actually was a five-day one from November 14th to November 19th. And then another one shortly after that from December 16th to January 6th. And I just wanted to show you the windows of those shutdowns. So here is the ones under Clinton. Now, notice the first one on the left-hand side of your screen. From the day that it was announced that the government shut down, there was a decline. You can see right here. There was a decline on that day of around half a percentage point. Big deal. But over the next three days, it actually had a pretty sharp increase. Okay, So there's, I'll chalk that up to a, a positive sign. I'm going to put a little plus sign next to that one just so I have a little reference here on how these have all turned out for um, individuals and, and markets overall. The next one started on the 16th of December. So it's actually, it's, this is slightly off. It should go... Yeah, so it started over the weekend, all right? So it really is this red candle. And from the moment that that government shutdown started to the day that it ended, markets overall were down 1.28%. But notice that there was quite a bit of oscillation here. You actually had markets up at one point and they were down. So I wouldn't get any real clear sense of direction. I would say overall, I'd give that a negative because over 21 days, it definitely declined. So now we move forward to President Obama's government shutdown which happened from October 1st to October 17th. You had a 16-day government shutdown. Now, of course, there's varying degrees of these government shutdowns and which services were shut down, et cetera, but I'm just going blanket statement. Here was a shutdown. What did the markets do, all right? And that's gonna be kind of the basis for what I think is gonna happen um, over the next couple of days. So since it started on October 1st, you guys can see right here is my October 1st candle. The day that that one was announced, it actually moved up which is surprising. Normally, you'd think they would move down. Now, when we go all the way through to the day that that one was uh, finished and cleared up was the 17th, which is actually here. And overall, those markets moved to the tune of roughly, give it the number for you, 3.02% over the next, uh, we'll call it 16 days. So that was a pretty big positive one. And now, we can go to the big daddy out there, which was almost as long as both of Clinton's and Obama's combined. That was President Trump's government shutdown. And lo and behold, there is your yellow box, which outlines that window of time. It was from December 22nd of 2018 to January 25th of 
2019. Now, notice the very beginning of it, it actually fell that day. It fell 2.06% that day. However, if you go from where that was announced to where it actually closed and finished, we had a pretty significant increase of 11.01%. Um, pretty... Yeah, yeah, and, and Big Eb says decent upturn after things get worked out. Yes, that's where I'm going to be going with this one in just a second. So you've got this, you know, great move, but then it really started to show some legs after that. So yeah, it did move up 11%, but ultimately, um, you know, this is a much bigger move to the upside, of course, going into the overall COVID piece. Now, what was it like after some of these other ones? I know I'm whipping in and out of different time frames here. I apologize for scrolling back and forth so quickly, uh, but let's go to that 2013 one again, just to see what it looked like. And you'll notice there's your 2013, All right? If I zoom in, okay, it, it was up, but then after that, pretty nice rally going forward. Now, what did Bill Clinton's do? You go back to 2000, or sorry, 90, 95, 96, going way back here. It also, after that government shutdown resolved, had a huge rip up. So I guess, Les, you know, it was a great question. And I, I toiled with this one today because I was sitting here going, man, should I just dump my, my Russell position right now and chalk it up to a great win? At this point, it's, it's a great win, um, but I do kind of feel negative over the next 30 days just because historically September and October are a bearish month. So I was a little bit nervous about that one and I decided I'm going to keep it. Uh, I'm going to keep it because I think what will happen, um, I think what's going to happen is you're, gonna not, you're not going to get a government resolution this weekend. I think what will happen is going into Monday and Tuesday, they'll stall and maybe you know we'll have a government shutdown for a couple of days. My feeling is that when the government shuts down, we'll probably have a knee-jerk reaction to the downside. I'll probably sell it. I'll probably close my short position that day because given what I've seen out of the previous four, while they are positive over the next, you know, 15, 20, 30 days, depending on the, uh, the shutdown length, there is an initial short-term knee-jerk reaction to the south side, and that's what I want to capitalize. What I don't want to get caught up with is all of a sudden they go through and get resolution, and it just rips to the upside, and I'm stuck in a losing position on this trade that was a great trade to begin with. So... Um, that's my, my long-winded answer to you, to you, Les, on do you have any thoughts about the government shutdown? I, I like it. I think there's actually a, uh, a good potential for a pop-up if we get resolution, although I don't know if we'll get much resolution. I think we're going to go to a shutdown, and I have a feeling it's going to drag on. Um, you know, The political divide has gotten stronger and stronger over the years, and now it just seems like it's at an apex uh, with regards to our current administration and, and many other things. So uh, I'm not that optimistic that they're going to come to a solution. Um, do I really care? Oh, it sounds so selfish. I, I kind of hope they don't. The longer that they struggle and, and have an impasse and shut down, you know, the more it impacts my short position, which I'm fine with. I think that's a good thing. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And I, I love those questions coming. And I apologize if the first time I answered it was a little bit um, not, not dismissive. It's just I didn't have all the facts and figures. And so I wanted to go back and look at what were the impacts of these previous events when they happened. Surprisingly, almost all of them were positive, right? There was one under Obama that was negative during the strike, but after, or during a strike, I keep calling it a strike, after the shutdown, but after that, it ripped to the upside. So I think that once we get a resolution, once the government comes up with whatever deal it is and whatever money gets sent to Ukraine, whatever they do for the border, once all that's done, um, it could be a pretty nice pop for the equity market. So I got to be pretty careful with my short position. I'll let you know if I close that one out. I have a gut feeling I'll probably close it out next week. Remember, my timeline, my absolute drop dead get out of my Russell short position is October 20th. That's it. I'm not allowed to hold it past that at all. So if I can get out before then, I'm okay with that as well. Uh, again, I don't want to be too greedy on that one. Um. Dave says, I wonder what the dollar did during all that. Good question. It would probably take me too long to do it all live right now. Actually, no. Let's go this. Here's a dollar index. And let me uh, real quick show you. You guys can, you can, you can, um, <laughs> you can blame Dave for this part. We just took a detour. It was like, oh, look, squirrel. Let's go over there. Uh, let's go and just see what the dollar index did during that. So remember, the first one, the big one, was Donald Trump's government shutdown. And that was back here in... Uh, December of 2018. So let me just put some vertical, uh, some goal posts on this one. 
And we'll go to December 22nd was the date that it started, which means we came in Monday morning and there's your, there's your, oops, dab nab it, sorry, I meant to do a vertical line. And that was on the 22nd. We came in on that morning of the 24th and it worked. Hold on, we're doing a little, little dancing over here. There we go, 24th. Uh, and that one ended on January 25th. So we can go right to here. The dollar actually sold off. All right, so you can see the dollar is actually drifting down. Not aggressive, but the dollar was heading down. <laughs> exactly. Don't forget to tip your house. That's right. Uh, so that was, and that's probably why we saw the markets rally, right? You know, we could come up with a million different speculations as to why the dollar dropped like that, but there is an inverse relationship. That if the dollar is showing weakness, markets are going to be showing strength. And underneath this Trump one, we actually saw a pretty big market rally almost the entire time. Now, what did it do under Clinton? Uh, no, uh, Obama, right? That was 2013 but it was only two weeks in October. So we'll go 2013. Uh, here is your October month. And that was October uh, 1st through 17th. There is the first. And you can see the 17th was, oh, actually, it was choppy. We were down for a little bit and then we're up for a little bit. O overall, that kind of uh, was representative of that period. It was slightly up, but the market for the dollar was choppy. And the last one I will look at here is Mr. Clinton's. If I can get the dollar to go back that far, I don't think I can. Oh, uh, maybe. Oh, I guess I'm going to get it. It's our lucky day. So this was 95 to 96, right? There's your 95 to 96. When we put the vertical line and the start date of that one, it was uh, the, the big one, What the 21 day was December 1st. So I'll go December 1st, which is right there. That's the Monday. And then the uh, second part of that when it was resolved was January 6th. I can go to right there. We really don't have a ton of time here uh, to transpire for these ones to show big gains. It was really just chopping sideways for that entire 16 or 21 day period on that one. So there you go. Thank you, Dave. We got that one. Your question has been answered. So not a lot really happened. And I'll be honest, there's not a lot of time there. You know, when you're looking at 16 or 20 days, it's hard to get the dollar to have a, a, a huge move. So, and I guess it would make sense as to why the dollar wouldn't move much because if you don't really know what's going on with the government, you know, why would you want to be making a definitive play on the dollar? It's kind of like picking a stock direction. If the government goes to hell in a handbasket, well, then you have directions as to the dollar. If they make all kinds of great policy changes that are going to benefit America and make us even stronger, you have definitive direction of the dollar. But when it's in an impasse and government shutdowns, it's like, well, where the heck is it going to go? This is my, nothing but taking time for the most popular members of Congress. <laughs> Talking time. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, we had uh, Dan Feinstein pass away today. Um, you know... Part of me wants to commend many of them for doing their part in trying, I say trying because it's very difficult to do, but trying to make either their state or our country a better place. And having committed most of their life to it um, is commendable. However, you know, I look back and say, well, what, what did we really get accomplished? This is not just necessarily Dianne Feinstein, but you know, other uh, elected officials. I, for one, am absolutely for term limits. Um, I believe that there should be a term limit on, on every elected official. Therefore, we can kind of rotate through, get some new ideas, some new perspectives, and not get stuck in our old ways. Many times, I think getting stuck in your old ways hinders progress, hinders growth, hinders development. And I, I feel like we're kind of stuck in that spot as well. So uh, we'll see who now replaces Mrs. Feinstein. Um, Jim says, Merlin, have you discussed lately thoughts on how long governments can continue printing money, causing inflation and interest rate hikes? Uh, no, I haven't discussed it, but the answer is real simple. The government can print money as long as it wants. It will print money as long as it possibly wants. There's nobody that can tell the government the difference. And I guess I have to drink to that one because I wish I could just print money over and over and over. Um, Big Eb says term limits and no insider trading. Not only no insider trading, but the one that bothers me most of all of this, and this should bother you as well. Look, I'm short the market. I, I think the market's going down because I believe that the economy is not where it's at. I believe that historically, September and October are negative months, and I believe that the, um, the Russell is a little bit ahead of itself. And so therefore, I'm betting the markets are going to be going down. The difference is, I am an individual consumer. I'm a citizen of the system. I'm a part of this machine, and I don't have a say in how those cogs are functioning. Every single senator and congressman and woman should be prohibited by making it a criminal offense 
if they short the market. Because remember, if I'm shorting the market, I'm betting the markets are going to go down. But I, as Merlin or Tom Barr here or Margaret or Dave, you're not making all the policy that could make America better and get us out of that problematic situation. When I see an elected official shorting the markets, it makes me feel like they're not going to do their job to get us out of the problem because they would benefit by us being in a deeper problem. Oh, do I want to get us out of the recession? I'm short. What do I care? Go into a depression for all I care because I'm short. That's the problem I have. So I, I think that insider trading should be banned, but I also think it should be a criminal offense if they short the markets in any way, shape, or form, betting that America's going to go down. They shouldn't be able to short American businesses or the economy overall, period. Uh, let's not leave out the federal decision, management maker. Yep, loopholes. It's funny. It's, insider trading is illegal for you and I, but they can do it regularly, and they're the ones that are being lobbied by all these professionals. That just... Um, Shocking to me that this happens. There was actually, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was actually proposing that it would be illegal for all government, um, all elected officials to trade, to do all this stuff. And I was like, okay, I, I, I'd support that, but the inmates are running the prison here. So they're the ones that are going to make the rules and good luck. All right, let's go to uh, our, our weekly rundown. I would, or sorry, weekly, our monthly rundown. This was interesting. We had an, a complete about face here with regards to the performance for these markets for the month. So I'm going to put this on a monthly time frame, my charts here, and as I run through these, I will show you how they look and get you the percentage gains or declines as they may be. I thought it was uh, uh, pretty pretty crazy the way this, this month finished. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, I remember when they made an example of Martha Stewart. Isn't it funny that Martha Stewart has done more jail time than, than Snoop Dogg, who's a gangster and <clears throat> uh, killed somebody but got away with it? Uh, gotta love that. Gotta love the legal system. Margaret Stewart went to jail not because of insider trading. You know that, right? She didn't go to jail for insider trading. She went to jail for perjuring herself under oath. That's why she went to jail. Oops. So let's uh, let me. Oop, before I look like I'm another goober and make a bad mistake here, let me go back here and change it to the month of um, September because it was September. And then a day in the park. I'm not going to sing today. That'd be a bad idea. All right, so let's look at the month of September, what our performance numbers were. Boom. Start things off at the bottom. Thank goodness it's my biggest position, at least right now, directly. Silver is actually my biggest overall position, but I have a pretty big um, intrinsic value, or not an intrinsic value, but. Um, the value of my short position of Russell is pretty damn big. So Russell for the month down 6.35%, making it your worst performer, but uh, they're, they're all pretty bad. Here is your monthly chart. And again, I'm leaving the head and shoulders on there just because I don't think we've finished this one out. That's why I apologize because this chart's starting to look pretty ugly. Um, I hope, my goal is that I can remove this head and shoulders pattern because we met this lower object here right around 1670. Uh, that'd make me very happy if that did happen, but we got a long way to go until we get to that one. All right, so that was your Russell 2000 down 6.35% for the month, making it your worst performer. Moving up that list, you have the NASDAQ 100 was down 5.2% for the month. These are all monthly charts that we're looking at. So when I show you these pictures, you know, these are summarizing the entire trading month. Um, this one's pretty bad, and notice what's what's interesting about it, at least for me, is on the monthly, we came back down and we did tap this lower part here, which goes back to a low that we saw all the way back into August. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a weekly time frame. Let me get the monthly. I, I was on the wrong time frame. My bad. Apologize. Um, so we did come back and tap this low that we achieved back here in August. So it's kind of a double tap on this low right around 14600 for the NASDAQ 100. Um, I actually really like this weekly time frame because you guys can see it feels like it's getting slowly weaker, doesn't it? I think you guys can see that one right here. Uh, lower highs and the same lows. So one of my personal favorite patterns out there is called a descending triangle. If I go through the peaks alone, there's your descending triangle. I could also go through the bodies of this and there's your descending triangle. But either way, the tops are getting lower. The bottom is staying the same. That's pressure building to the downside. We'll see if that one um, breaks in the coming weeks. But we did have on the weekly here, kind of a spinning top formation. On the monthly, it's a little bit different. We had just nothing but a big down red candle. So we've had two consecutive months in a row where that NASDAQ 100 has been just getting crushed. Um, granted, I think it's definitely due for a pullback given all the gains we've seen over the past you know, nine months. Next on our list, moving to the upside for the month of September, 
making it a clean sweep of the indexes. I mean, this is pretty ugly for anybody who's got a 401k or retirement account like that. 5.10% down for the S&P 500. Here is your monthly chart of that one. Um, you notice that I've got this little yellow box on here, right? And so I like having little yellow boxes on my screen because it does help me figure out where I think things are going to go. Well, two consecutive months, 5.1% down for the S&P. Let's slice this open into a weekly. And notice that weekly demand zone, you still can't see exactly why it's created because it was created off the daily time frame. And we tiptoed into it on the weekly and bounced out. Check out our daily. All right, I have that one mapped out as this kind of area of consolidation over here that goes all the way back into June of this year. We tiptoed into it. Um, and again, that's why I was thinking we'd see a bounce out of it. We did. Uh, we didn't get follow through. And I, and I own apology. How many of you guys follow me on Twitter? Anybody follow? I really don't do much on Twitter. I'm, I'm going to try to do more. I will try to do much better at, um, at updating and charts and more financial stuff versus just straight hatred towards Sam because obviously I, I hate that guy. Uh, but I'll try. Since I've been blocked, I guess I have no reason to hate him anymore. I can't even see what he does, which is probably good for me. Um, I will do a lot more uh, positive things out there with regards to markets and updates and tweets. And um, there's been some fun stuff that's been going on. But if you follow me on Twitter, I posted the other day kind of, you know, why I was expecting this bounce to happen, which you guys know I talked about there. And I was expecting it to bounce up, but the number that I posted, let me just double click this line right here. I'll put the number on here. I did 4370. Okay. So that was the line that I, I think I may have said it on this show. And I also um, posted out on my Twitter feed. I have to apologize because I said I think we're going to bounce. When we were down here at this 28, you know, 4280 mark, I was like, uh, I don't know. I think we're going to bounce. They're going to bounce. And I said 4370. If you notice the high for today was 4371 and a quarter. I was off by one and a quarter points. So my apologies to anybody out there who was you know, glued to that. <laughs> Michael Anthony says, I don't even go there. Yeah, Twitter's definitely changed. I, I become a little bit more interested in Twitter. Um, since Elon Musk took over, actually, I think it's it's actually become much better. I get a lot less spam, and and I'm I, I seek out the news that I want to know more about. There's a lot of great spaces, especially in the crypto space, which is some an area that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I don't follow any trading groups for stocks, options, futures, or forex or anything like that, but I do follow the crypto community. I think is much more active on Twitter and social media, but. Uh, you know, if you are in the markets, you should have Elon Musk on your Twitter watch list because when that guy says something, he could actually have profound impacts on the market. Uh, what day was that? That was uh, yesterday or day before. It was, uh, I think, the 27th. I think I did it the night of the 27th. After I did the show, I went on there because I, I needed to start doing more on Twitter. Obviously, it's one way to create engagement and create uh, maybe some followers out there that, that join the show as well. Tom said, I follow you on X, but didn't check in much. Uh, my feed is much more balanced since Elon cleaned it up. It, for me too, it's been a lot better. Clown World, okay, Big Ab, Clown World is good, but some of the stuff is just outright disturbing. I mean, um, I, I don't know if you guys saw the one, there was a kid walking down the street in Chicago and he's literally just walking down the street with his backpack on, he's eating a sandwich and these two guys run up behind him and just literally start beating the crap out of him. It, that stuff's just hard for me to watch. Completely unprovoked, completely unnecessary, I don't know. But yeah, Clown World is a pretty damn funny one. Um, Cody, my uh, Twitter handle is Trader Merlin, one word. You just go at, there you go. And don't use any other ones. If, there's a, if it's not spelled that way or if it's got a gap in it, there's a lot of people that will try to scam you. It seems like every couple of months I get somebody has copied my profile on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and they're trying to sell you Bitcoin, they're trying to sell you financial services, they're trying to sell you all kind of different stuff. I'm not selling you anything right? Um, I do this because I enjoy it. I love the community that we have. I wish we actually had like a physical classroom so I could see all you guys interact. But of course, we um, we can't really do that. Uh, maybe down the road, uh, I will look at monetization. But for now, uh, ads are the only thing that you will be getting from me. And unfortunately, I know that's a, some of you don't like it, but I got to do something to make a couple extra bucks. Uh, Elon went to the board yesterday and requested more civilian. He did. Uh, and you know, because he wants more people to be using Twitter to spread news. You know, the challenge I think you would all agree with news is, how do I know what you're posting is real, right? Pepe, you may post some great thing I find very compelling, and I'm like, man, this is this is crazy. Wow, wow, wow. And if I did some research, I find out it might not actually be real. You know, for example, there was a video, 
I think I played it, I mentioned this one when I started the show, John O'Donnell sent this one around on Facebook and it was a, a video of President Obama at the podium going, we must oppress American people. We must control their thoughts and ideas so they don't rise against us. And I was like, that, that's not something Obama would say, ever. What happened was he was at a press conference and he said, when we look at Russia, Russia believes that they must control their people, that we can't let them rise up. It, it was a statement about Russia's control over their people, but someone took it out of context and edited out certain pieces, and now it sounded like Obama. So the tough part is, you know, what is actually real information? And Twitter actually has done a much better job of when someone posts a, a fact uh, of actually checking some of those facts and posting down below, here's where this image was sourced from, and this is the real image. Um, you might, there's a funny one about Ricky Gervais going around right now where, uh, you know, he's very offensive at some of the award ceremonies he does, and all the celebrities are like, in shock at Ricky Gervais. Well, the reality is that picture was actually taken not from Ricky Gervais' um, award speech, but when they made the wrong announcement for La La Land being the best picture of the year or something like that. <clears throat> yeah, ma'am on. Yeah, Bob passed away, so did the Twitter account. There's some, there's some decent people out there that are you know worth following. Um, got a little Caesar ad right now. Mm. Five seconds, wow. Pizza, pizza. I'm glad it's pizza ads. I, I, I would love it. Let me know if they're trading companies because I'm curious to see who would be advertising, um, trying to capitalize on my show from that perspective. All right, I'm almost done. Let me get through these. We have the indexes out of the way. It gets more interesting here because this is all negative and, and aggressively negative, right? Well, you also have gold. Now, I don't know exactly, and some of you may know what the heck happened today, but gold and silver were just getting slaughtered today. Gold um, on a daily basis wasn't as bad. Right? Here's your, your gold chart. Of course, it's been trending. Yo, Keem, thank you very much for the contribution, my friend. I appreciate it. Um, look at the last six days of gold. I mean, it's actually five have been nothing but down. You've seen a really aggressive decline in the price of gold to the tune of 4.04% in just four bars. So that's actually five trading sessions. But check out silver before I go into other markets. Look at this candle today. In, in crypto, they call the, the opposite. This would be called a god candle, right? A god candle is just a giant green candle that eclipses everything. This is one of the biggest engulfing candles I think I've ever seen. It's crazy. What it shows here is SLV gapped up to the tune of 3.13%, which fine to me, right? Great. Make it, make it happen. But look at the range for today, right? The range for silver today from top to bottom, right? From peak to trough here, 5.39% swing. And that's just the down move. It doesn't even include that 3% up. So you have like an 8%, almost 9% swing in silver today. I got to do a little bit of digging to see what the heck happened there. Of course, you guys know I am uh, long on silver. Uh, the good things, yeah, right, Lisa, if that was a God candle, that might be a devil candle, right? That could be <laughs> the hell candle. Um, but notice where we are. You know, I, don't, I don't like this picture at all because... If I take this red line up here and move it down to where I see most points of contact on silver, you can see we, we, we pretty much hit this level a couple days ago. We hit it back on September 14th. We came really close on the uh, 15th and 16th of August. We hit it multiple times in June, and it was this area of consolidation all the way back to March of 2023. This area looks pretty damn good for me, and now we're below it. We broke that one. We closed below it. That is absolutely horrible news for me holding silver. Now, I'm okay with silver. I'll hold it long term. I don't care. I'll just keep selling calls against my position. Uh, right now, my calls all expire on, in October, October 20th. So I got plenty of time there. I've got the 22s and the 2250 calls sold. So I'm pretty sure those will expire worthless until something uh, changes. But yeah, I don't like this picture. This is a today was particularly bad for silver because we broke down below that long standing line of support here. And now the question I have to ask myself is, What's the possibility of us getting back to the origin of this gap at 1970 or possibly even closing that gap and getting down towards that $19 mark? That'd be pretty pretty painful given the amount of uh, SLB shares to have at this present moment in time. But yeah, gold for the month down point or sorry, 4.76% making it your fourth worst. Now, good news is we started to get some positive action, but again, the stuff that you see positive here is actually negative for the markets, which of course might explain why we saw these moves. So here's your dollar index. By the way, before I show you the monthly, look at the hammer formation today on the dollar index. We were down pretty good. It was a pretty aggressive sell-off today on that dollar index and came screaming back up, which is why I think you see negative moves in our equity indexes overall. Now the weekly paints a different picture, right? That is 
really a long topping tail going back in overhead supply. That actually shows a bearish picture. And then in honor of Bob Dunn, we'll throw that monthly on there. Well, this candle doesn't tell us much yet, but it's a very uh, a nice picture because you got a breakout, a sideways consolidation, and coming right up into that, uh, that blue line I've got drawn right around 107. So still feeling bullish on silver, but um, that weekly time frame makes me feel like you're going to see a little bit of a pullback. The daily time frame is bullish. <laughs> I mean, it's tough because now I've got conflicting signals. Monthly bullish, weekly bearish, daily bullish. So which one do you go with, right? Um, let's see what else I got. Well, what strike might you now use for silver? Are you talking about for selling puts or for selling calls? Because I may actually go sell some more puts on silver. I'm okay long-term having a much bigger position in silver. It's fine with me. I'm okay with that. Um, over time, silver will oscillate and fluctuate, but it will slowly go up over time due to scarcity and utilization and solar and things like that. All right, yields drop. Oh, so let's let's we're not there yet. Don't jump the gun there, big app. We have the dollar index point, 2.46%. Let's go to Bitcoin. 3.87%. And again, we have discussed this a little bit. I do think that you're going to see by the end of the year a spot Bitcoin ETF approval. I am still on that camp. I am absolutely, I'm not certain, but I think with a high probability that we are going to see um, Bitcoin get that approval by the end of the year. I heard something today that the SEC has reached out to four different firms that have applications for uh, a a spot Bitcoin ETF and have asked for more information on backend infrastructure and how they're going to be custodying Bitcoin and things like that. So that that's a monstrously positive sign for any of us that are uh, pro Bitcoin. And, and I'm certainly in that camp. Noam says, will it fill the gap? I don't know. Um, you know, typically when you see a break like this, uh, of a long standing, I'm not gonna really call this a demand zone because it's, it's more like just a, uh, it's just support, right? It's not a zone really anymore. It's just kind of this line that you can see hitting. Once we've now closed below that, my mind automatically thinks that we are going to challenge that gap and we most likely fill it. Why? Well, because we've been making lower highs and lower lows for a while here with silver. Um, could it close? I mean, what's the probability? I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I can give you a probability, but 50-50 that we get all the way, we close this gap. That's, it's certainly not odds that I'm, I want. I'm not really happy about this. I did not like this close today at all on silver. I think that's pretty um, detrimental to my long position. At least it's going to keep me underwater for a little bit. But um, you ask what calls or what puts I might sell. I would go out there and see if there's any premium uh, at, at that level I've got drawn right there, which is the equality. Well, I, I'd actually move it up to 19, right? So there you can just call that one the 19. And you also have the origin of this gap, which would be closer to, let's say, 1950. Well, Actually, I'll go. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do the 20s right now. I, w I definitely wouldn't do the 20s. It's a little too close for comfort. But again, it depends on how far out you're looking, right? I typically would go to the monthly contract, which means I'd do the October 20th. Um, make sure. I, I keep saying 20th, but for some reason, 17th stuck in my head. Yeah, it's the 20th. Uh, I'd be looking at that monthly contract on SLV and see if there's enough premium at that $19 mark. Probably not going to be a lot of premium because it's just it's not that far away. Uh, but you might be able to get a half a percent for the next two weeks. There we go. Yep, exactly, Rob. That, that's what makes me nervous right now is I don't see anything really strong here that could support that. So, yeah, not feeling that comfortable on my uh, silver trade. But it is what it is. I'm fine with that. And let's keep moving up. Oil, 8 point. 8.66% 8, 8 up for crude oil. That's been one of those charts that, you know, even though it was down 1% today, looking beautiful there's your daily we've had two down days in a row i'll show you the monthly here let me get these lines off uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna leave these other these two lines on here because that's the what i think someone mentioned was jp morgan or goldman sachs said they thought oil is gonna get to 150 bucks uh, i still am in the camp of 100 dollars by the end of the year i think that's gonna be not that difficult to do but uh, we were now one percent on the day the weekly i would argue still looks good i'm oh, sorry the monthly Right? We've had this nice big rally, had a pullback into a demand zone, and now trending up. The key is, do we break the new high, or the previous highs we saw back in 2022? Uh, I don't know. I don't have any dog in that fight right now. But you, know, you are coming into some choppy areas of supply that goes back into August and September of this year. Not really that strong. I still think that $100 mark is the most logical target to the upside.
Uh, Merlin, you should somebody do a special show. Bring some of your favorite traders and have inform informal conversations with them about trading. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I've had issues on this show with uh, mics coming in, meaning when I have multiple guests on doing a Zoom room, and, and I'd rather have it in person. So I, ideally, I'd like to have kind of a round table set up, but I need to do some work here. I need to get some more cameras because here, here's how the difference a camera makes, right, everybody? So this is the camera that you guys helped purchase. I, you took some of the, the donations you guys gave and I bought this camera and the, and the quality of this one's great. Here's what I was using before. This is a, a simple Logitech. Now, I, it's funny because on my previous screen, this one looks way better. It looks brighter, but it's blown out. I got like a hot spot on my forehead. It's super bright in here. Um, the, the Canon is just a much better camera. So what I'd like to do ultimately is have you know, two or three cameras set up. So if I did have, you know, Larry sitting off to my side and maybe I had Todd over here, you know, we could have a nice discussion and I haven't quite set the room up for that, um, but I would love to be doing things like that. But but I'm, I'm much, I would much rather have them in person. You know, the ability to just turn over, hey Todd, when I do it online, I don't know. I, it, does, it doesn't have the same vibe. I think you guys would all agree that taking a class online is not the same as sitting in a classroom with 30 students around you bouncing ideas off, so. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show you the difference. I have this, this, uh, there, there's me gone. I have this Logitech here as like an emergency. I, I keep it there just in case something goes wrong with my camera or something. I can use this one, but it, it looks so bad. <laughs> Remember it used to make me like super hot pink. Like I look like I was sunburnt. <laughs> I like this one better. This is more my, tr my true colors as Cindy Lauper would say. All right, let's go to our final one. Oh gosh, that picture's gross. Um, so the Don Franz show, um, yeah, I love doing that one. That's fun, but we're not in person. And I was going to try to do Don Franz today, but he, he sent me a message saying, uh, let me just make sure because I, I have a bunch of things going on. But uh, I messaged him real quick because I think Lori was saying, get on Don Franz show. I'm happy to do it. Um, he says, I don't think I can make it home today. So, so next Friday, we'll shoot for next Friday. Uh, let me think out loud here. Do I have something going on next Friday? I think I'm safe for next Friday. What is next Friday? Next Friday is, uh, yeah, I'm fine for next Friday. So next Friday, I'll, I'll be in the Don Fran show. So we, we love doing that kind of thing where we talk, but we're also not in the same room. I think the discussions are much better and organic um, when I can look over and be like, you know, make faces at Larry like, what? Are you kidding me, Larry? But maybe um, I'll have Larry in my home studio because Larry lives somewhat close to me. So it'll be fun to have him on the program. Uh, why don't you like before when OTA gets a particular OTA instructor and why not interview them? Uh, I'd have to invite them to my house. And I honestly, I don't really follow who's in the centers anymore. It used to be kind of automatically scheduled when I did power trading radio. Uh, when I did power trading radio, they they would just say, oh, so-and-so is going to be in your studio. Well, it was awesome, right? They basically just scheduled them all the time. I love, loved it. It was great when they did that. The other, Mammon's right. There's not that many left. Um, we don't do that many physical classes, but you know, there are, there are a bunch that come through. The, the challenge would be this. Let's say I've got Jordan Matthews teaching in Irvine, which is close to my house. When he's done teaching, I know how it is. I just want to go home and I want to fall into bed and take a nap because I'm exhausted. My energy level of exertion is so much higher when I teach a physical class. All right? it's, it's off the charts. And like um, I'm teaching the week of October 9th. I'm going to be absolutely dead at the end of the day. I don't even know if we'll be able to host trivia on my normal Tuesday night. It's going to be so exhausted. But having asking an instructor to teach that class, then get drive to my place to do this type of interview it's not really not really in that interest you know not, i'm sure he's not going to want to do it um where do they all go well when you know a lot of centers have had to shut down for multiple reasons but covid certainly hurt a lot of it um a lot of them went to try to start their own thing which while some of them are i think some people that left actually are, are good instructors I think you start to lose value when you go to a school with one instructor. I think one of the huge values that OTA brought and still brings to the table is if you took core strategy, you could take core strategy with Jordan Matthews, and the next time it come, you, know, you see uh, you know, Larry Jacobs is teaching, and you start taking it with different people. While you're not going to like all of them, you're not, you know, not going to watch all of them go, oh, they were all just perfect. You're like, I like this one better than this one for this reason. And, and you start to learn different things from each one of them, uh, which is kind of why they asked me if I wanted to go back to the classroom. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'd be happy to go back through uh, and teach in the classroom. I think it'd be fun. I like that. Um, Scott McCormick. Yeah, uh, Scott loves this stuff. So do I. I, mean, I, I as you, obviously, that's why I do this show. Let's see. Um, 
With the cost of the dollar being so high and poor creditworthy companies being forced into even more expensive money, wouldn't you think that JNK would be even more bearish? Um, instead, isn't it somewhat sideways? So if you look at JNK, right, this is this is typical to what we're looking at with the short uh, with TLT and and the ten year. What I mean by that is if I look here and go to TLT, price has just been falling like a rock, and that's because the long year government treasuries, the ten year was what, really what we've been looking at. It's just been surging, and it's it's inverse relationship. So these ETFs that you're quoting are going to be the inverse, typically, of those um, ETFs. So here's the 10-year bond surging, right? Great week for the 10-year. Uh, it was down today a little bit, but all in all, looking great. The, the more this trends up, the more likely TLT is going to be going down. So when you look at JNK, right, corporate, this, what this tells me here is that corporate yields haven't surged that much. Now, what this... Um, JNK is doing is putting together a portfolio of corporate bonds, right? There, this is, there's no government treasuries in here. That's the JNK implies junk. So looking at um, you know high high yield stuff, and we might be able to. Let me see. I'm not sure if it will show us this, but let's go to barchart.com and I'll type in JNK and see if it gives us an uh, an idea of what they are holding in there. I, these holdings probably rotate too much to have an accurate uh, an accurate update of what's in that. But I go to bar chart, I clicked on, I typed in JNK, and here's the components to it. So here's your different bond yields. And you notice there's, they've got quite an assortment in here. I mean, this is really interesting. You've got Medline paying 3.87%. You have uh, Caesars, six and a quarter percent. But a lot of, you know, American Airlines, 5.75 and six and a half. So this is all corporate debt that they're holding. So if we start to see uncertainty and more uh, troubles ahead for these companies, they would be increasing their yields, meaning they, American Airlines would now issue new debt at 7% or 8%, which we'll probably start to see more of. If that does continue, then the price of JNK will most likely start to drift to the downside. The reason I don't think that you're seeing such a big um, change in JNK, because I think that even though yields are getting higher on junk bonds, I think more people are flowing into um short-term government treasuries why why take a risk on something like you know american airline uh, let's go what's a dish right so michael who michael anthony here he loves dish right why would i buy 5.25 percent dish bonds when dish has got some headwinds in front of it when i could just buy a three-month government treasury and make five and a half percent for the i make more for a much safer instrument, right? So I think part of it is you're seeing money go out of J&K into uh, short-term treasuries because you're, if you're chasing yield, go with the safe stuff right now. So I don't know if that necessarily answered your question out there on, um, let me see, that was for JB. I do think that overall, you will see J&K continue to slide. Why? Because if the long-term yields keep rising, then corporate corporations are gonna have to incentivize you through higher yields to buy their bonds which means you know, typically the lowest rate is going to be the 10-year. And everything else that corporations offer is going to be higher than that. Uh, let's see. Technician JD, sup? Uh, what do you think about AMD? A to the M to the D. Oh, I got 9388. You got it's pretty tight. Well, that's five points, I guess. Uh, Ninety-three eighty-eight. I mean, this is where I'd be buying. This is where I would. I, I think if it does fall, I think you're looking to turn at that level. So I think you're fine with that. I'm, I'm all right with that. I mean, there, there's my. If I'm drawing a demand zone, we've been on this uptrend since October. That little pullback, that's where I'm expecting it to bounce and turn off of. So looking good. No state tax on that TBL either, right, Big Ep? Gotta love that. A little bit of an extra, a little extra pop. All right, I have not even finished. And what time is it? I gotta wrap up. Oh my goodness, you push me to an hour show. Here I am trying to get out of 30 minutes and you just keep pulling me back in. All right, um, let's go to the final one here, which of course you've now guessed it since it's not the, it's not showing up on your screen here. And this is why we saw these markets tank so much. And that is the 10-year. 11.46% increase in the yield on the 10-year. That is just, just crazy to have that kind of a pop in one month. Uh, there's your weekly chart of it. 
Here is your monthly chart of it. Um, looking absolutely fantastic. Um, I guess fantastic if you want to be getting more yield. It's horrible if you're a long-term investor to see that thing surge this much so quickly. So <laughs> thanks, technician. Love you too. Um, so all in all, this is your leader. This is why we saw so much pain this month in the equity indexes. Again, the cost of capital. I've been saying this for a year now, that the higher that these yields go, the more it's going to pressure these markets to the south side, which again is why I have such a bearish position at this moment on the markets. And again, that may change based off of what uh, the government shutdown could be doing uh, in the next couple of days. Now, the last piece, I'm going to keep, I'm probably going to look at this a lot more um, over the next couple of months is just what's happened on the differential between the two and the 10 and the one and the 10 for those of you looking at that inverted yield curve. So here's your uh, one and the 10. Here's the two and the 10. We still have a ways to go, but it's definitely getting a lot, lot better with regards to inverted yield curve. But if it gets all the way up to this line, if we get this up here to this um, green line up here, markets are gonna feel some serious pain. Why? Because that means that 10-year bond is getting much higher and you're gonna see the cost of capital rise significantly for corporations. All right, well, Dish made $2.07 so far this year, which, okay, cool. Again, it's not, I'm not looking at the, uh, Look at that chart. I, I, I don't I don't care what they've done or what they're earning. That chart tells me a much more dramatic picture. You know, this red line right here is when I think you asked about it and I said, Dish is going down. I think I even wrote it on the screen there. Yeah, Dish is going down. Now, I don't know if it's going to go insolvent. I don't think that. But I mean, again, you've got monster competition. This is kind of like saying, you know, Bitcoin is crushing things like Western Union. Um, was it WU? Yeah. Now, Western Union has actually had a pretty significant bounce, but look at look what's gone on with Western Union. I mean, this company's just slowly been dying for the past couple years. Why? Because there's so many other choices for you to use to send money around the world. Well, now with Starlink, you have a much better choice for internet. Well, maybe not much better. That's, that's a bit biased. Uh, but you definitely have a... Um, a significant alternative and you know the way elon musk is going to work here is once he gets starlink set to the level that he wants i assure you here's what's going to happen he's going to do a huge sale huge discount on the box the unit to get connected to it and then charge an extremely low monthly fee which will choke out dish i don't think that he'll do it as a loss leader just to get dominance in that space and then slowly rise prices over time it's just typical business practices and uh, i don't know i just think there's too many headwinds there and your PAGs again. Here's PAGs. PAG Seguro. Go to our daily time frame here. Snooze fest. Horizontal. Now, granted, the, the scale here is a bit off because this thing's done some reverse splits, I'm pretty sure. Has it done some reverse splits or is it just that bad? No, it's just that bad. Um, so PAGs went from over $60. Now it's trading at $8.61. I still don't like the trend. My belief would still hold true, which is by if it starts to prove to you that it's making some new highs at this point right now it's not making any new highs it's actually starting to make some new lows so uh, on both of these i would say i'm not saying you have to short them i don't like shorting stocks under 10 bucks anyway uh but i would say you sit on, sit on the sidelines and put your money to use in something that's got a nice trend going up versus something that you hope will go up and pag seguro looks like it's headed down and i look at dish Looks like it's going down right now too. So um, I'm not saying that, he, that they're done. I, I think this is not like GameStop. I think GameStop is done. It's just a matter of how long it takes for it to die. Whereas um, Dish, eh, they got some increased competition, but they got another couple years left till I think Elon Musk fully rolls out Starlink. And when that happens, I think Dish is done. Dish is, uh, Dish is TV not streaming on the internet. It's a huge, yeah, uh, exact, um, right. But here's my point. Because he has this giant internet in the sky, how easy is it for him to now offer a streaming service through his network? So he, you know, you set up the internet in the sky, and you get everybody connected to that, then you offer a service for streaming media like YouTube TV, right? You offer your own. It'll be called XTV. And it'll be just like YouTube, but now he'll connect all these different channels. If you want to be a part of all this, you're going to have to give him some concession as a, as a media provider. He's a smart man. Um, there's power to having a mesh over the entire globe with regards to internet. And I think at that point, um, these companies will face some, some struggles. We're still a ways away from that, I believe, but I think it's pretty clear what he's trying to do.
uh, at least in my opinion. HughesNet, nice. Uh, high rule when trading stocks. I, a stock must have a lot of open interest like in, in the thousands. I agree. And, and the main reason for that is you want to make sure that you have the, uh, the pun here, you have the option to go and use options. I think you get so much extra firepower by using options. So yeah, uh, I, I think you have to have that kind of liquidity as well. Absolutely. Um, one last piece here, John. Oh my God. I, and let me just wrap this one up here. John says, while researching how to stake my atom, I discovered a calculator that figures out the optimal amount of days to stake before restaking with the rewards gained and added on. I'm wondering if you go through this process or just let the original staked amount ride. Um, I don't use the calculator. What I'll do is I, when I go look at my account, I will go and go, oh, yeah, I should probably claim it. Like, for example, right now, I have a bunch of staked rewards from Adam and I should probably restake those. So I don't use a calculator for the optimal ones. Just periodically I will do that. But thank you, John, because you reminded me that I should probably log into my uh, ledger and claim my staking rewards, which I've had there probably for six months now. Re-add that and compound them in and hopefully uh, keep things going on there. Do you, think it will go up, do you think it will go public because the only thing he has now public is, is Tesla? Um, it's a great question. You know, typically when something goes public, it's a money grab, right? They're looking to get to raise a, shh, I'll be careful, I don't want to swear today, a lot of capital. He doesn't need it. Like, I don't know, man. I, I agree with Tom. Tom said here a while back um, that he believes Elon Musk is going to take t uh, Twitter, make it private, and then re-release that at some point here in the near future with a big IPO. I, I kind of feel like he's going to do that too. Um... I don't know. When you have FU money, and he is loaded with FU money, right? He doesn't, I don't think he really even cares. I think he's going to keep parlaying these into bigger and bigger endeavors. Um, and, you know, I, I think that Elon Musk will probably be the first trillionaire. If he does go public with um, Starlink, I think you're talking a massive, massive valuation. Absolutely massive. Because it's no longer just, oh, we're going to cater to the U.S. markets. We have basically, we can connect everybody global. It kind of flies in the face of, I, I imagine antitrust on this bad boy. I'm sure governments around the world are going, no, 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 no. We can't have Elon Musk controlling all the information that's sent from the European Union, you know, the Japanese, and all of us connected, and they've had access to all the info. Boy, there's a lot of things to consider once it goes down the road. But Technician JD, do I think he'll, want, he'll sell it? Probably. I mean, you look at some of the stuff he's kept private so far, you know, he's, he could easily have gone public with some of the other stuff that he's done, but he hasn't. So I don't know. I don't know the, the uh, perspective there. All right. I got to wrap up. I got, uh, I got places I got to go. So let's do this. Uh, if you guys have comments, questions, feedbacks, things you want me to discuss for our Monday show, you can send them on in. The email's on your screen at tradermerlin at gmail.com. If you are trading on Monday for the U.S., you have ISA Manufacturing PMI. You also have um, Fed Chair Powell will be speaking, and that's going to be at 8 a.m. on Monday, 8 a.m. Pacific time. So that's an hour and a half into the market. Keep, mark that on your calendar. Put a sticker, a sticker on your computer because an hour and a half into the trading session, you could see some pretty volatile swings, and you're going, what, what's, what's happening? It's because Jerome Powell is speaking, and again, whatever he says can move these markets. You also have construction spending going on for the U.S., and that's pretty much it for your Monday session. There are no major earnings. Um, no guests on Monday. I do have um, Justin Krebs going to be on on Tuesday. We're going to talk about end of year kind of tax planning and taxation pieces because I had a couple questions on that. So we'll look at that from a long-term investment perspective. So again, comment down below any of the YouTube videos, things that you want me to discuss on the show. Comments or questions can also be sent in at tradermerlin at gmail.com. Until then, happy trading. Have a fantastic weekend. Go do something fun. I'll see you guys on Monday. Take care.